My brother was stabbed to death when I was 10 years old. It's the first black on black teenage murder in the United Kingdom. My brother Danny, yeah? He was killed in a place called Metro, just up the road from here. And I was 10 years old. I became very introvert at that time. And then I started hurting people. And hurting people just to find out what it was like to really hurt people. So I became very vicious. I became very um, withdrawn. Didn't have no friends. And then crime, that was my money. That never ending cycle of crime and deprivation. It just continued. Sometimes you do well, you make money, you do well. Other times it never lasts because like, the police only have to get lucky once. You have to get lucky every single time. You know what I mean? And the luck of the dice, it never works that way. That's the biggest gamble, you know? It weren't until 2002 when I got sentenced to 23 years, I said to myself, I need to get some knowledge. Conspiracy to rob seven security vans and uh, firearms. It was kind of an injustice really because I was banged up in the unit with um, the dome robbers and they got 15 years. My crew got 23, 24 and 26. You know what I mean? It, it, because we was all, I think, it's got a lot to do with the skin, you know? The colour of, colour of my skin because we was an organised um, band of arm robbers. Because I've done a lot of law work for the guys. Done all their ACATs, done all their, um, their, their, their recategorizations, I've done all their appeals, showed them how to do it themselves and learn to do it themselves. I bought an Archibald for £250, had a brand new Archibald and I learned to use the law the way it's supposed to be used. And I taught guys how to work their cases because I noticed that most guys leave it to their solicitor. And it says within every adversity there's an equal seed of opportunity. So I've all the way through my whole birth, I've found the positivities to use to, to better myself. So coming out now, I've wanted to pass that on to the youngsters. Manuel, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity. It's a pleasure to meet you. How are you doing? It's a pleasure. I'm good. Everything's good. I'm in a good place right now. Indeed. So, uh, Manuel's had a crazy life, but he's doing absolutely fantastic things at this point now. I'm doing a lot to help the community, a lot of feeding the homeless, a lot of teaching people. He's written books, done degrees, but it hasn't always been like that. And like most of his, he's had his fair share of trauma and madness. Well, the, uh, the trauma in my life, which started me on the path of crime, was my brother was stabbed to death when I was 10 years old. It's the first black on black teenage murder in the United Kingdom. My brother Danny, yeah? He was killed in a place called Metro, just up the road from here. And I was 10 years old. I became very introvert at that time. And then I started hurting people. And hurting people just to find out what it was like to really hurt people. So I became very vicious, I became very um, withdrawn, didn't have no friends, and then crime, that was my money. I started working on Portobello Road before that incident with a guy named Lenny Kane, big Lenny Kane, a boxer, who taught me to fight. And because it was all run by white people on the Portobello and they were very racist, he taught me to fight and look after myself and said, well, you've got to be able to look after yourself on Portobello Market if you're going to work it. So I ended up working with him. But after my brother got murdered, life, everything just changed for me. You know, they started sending me to psychiatrists and school people and stuff like that. But I never went to school, yeah? So I ended up truing in and just going out there and robbing and thieving and doing whatever by any means necessary. And um, later on in life, that led me down a horrible path. I'd done ball school in 1979, yeah? Um, got shipped out of Rochester Borstal to Portland Borstal for fighting. Ended up in Portland Borstal. There was two black guys in there, me and a guy named Chang. Yeah? We ended up in there and uh, came out from there and then it just continued and continued. You know, like that, that, that never ending cycle of crime and deprivation. It just continued. 
Sometimes you do well, you make money, you do well. Other times it never lasts because like, the police only have to get lucky once. You have to get lucky every single time. You know what I mean? And the luck of the dice, it never works that way. That's the biggest gamble, you know? It weren't until 2002 when I got sentenced to 23 years, I said to myself, I need to get some knowledge. The first thing was, wasn't to get some knowledge and I'll oh, get on the, get on the knowledge thing and be knowledge and the earth, air, fire and water and, you know what I mean? Like scientific and all that. It was because I couldn't read and write properly. And my daughter, I, I, used, I was double A cat, so you only get a call every so often and then it's got to be booked if they don't answer the call at that time. So I said to my daughter, how are we going to... She said, Dad, write to me. So what I'd done, I started drawing. And I had to say to my daughter, I didn't want to lie, I said to her, look, I can't read and write. So she said, I'll teach you. So her, she was doing her plus 10 at the time. So she started sending me all her plus 10 work and blah, blah. So I was in solitary confinement learning all this stuff, you know, and getting corrected. Then they sent, you know, when they integrate you into the prison system, they say like, you start going to education out of the block once a week, or you, the, the education officer comes down to see you. So I started doing my like entry level, which was plus 10 at the time, entry level work and stuff like that. I've done my entry level stuff and then I just continued. I got a thirst for knowledge. I've done my, I've done three GCSEs, history, maths and English. I passed them. Then I've done five A levels, passed them. Then I got a, a, a um, introduction to Open University. Yeah, and I passed that exam and I got into university and then I started on social sciences. Done all the levels for social sciences and got my degree. And then I just continued continued with the knowledge. Incredible, it's incredible. But going back slightly, so what what sort of led you to get a 23 year sentence? What was the crime? And obviously was that your first big sentence? You mentioned obviously ball stores and stuff like this. Yeah, through. that was, that was, yeah. And did you yeah, have any sort of big sentence no. to for that? No. Yeah, so 23 years sentence, what was that for? That must be for a serious crime. Um, um, conspiracy to rob seven security vans and uh, firearms. It was kind of an injustice really because I was banged up in the unit with um, the dome robbers and they got 15 years. My crew got 23, 24 and 26. You know what I mean? It, it, because we was all, I think it's got a lot to do with the skin, you know, the colour on, color on my skin because we was an organised um, band of arm robbers, I suppose. And so how did they get you for that conspiracy to seven? Obviously they might probably do one or plan to do one. How did you end up getting this Well they didn't catch us doing none. They just had us under observation for two years, piled it all together and used seven examples of seven vans what had been robbed and said that that was our crew. Mm. But obviously it's fair to say at that point then that you're a career criminal who sort of elevated his way to the top of the crime that's what, world on the That's what they call it, yeah. That's what they say it is, yeah. And so, for you looking back now, was it a, obviously the, the amount of time you got was ridiculous in 23 years, but was it less than end up stopping you on the path you were on? Were you on a dangerous nah, path at that point? Nah, it was nuts because like we was we were setting up to do the massive one, you know, the yeah, millionaires and all that. But um, the thing is, that was the most devastating thing to ever happen to me, apart from the death of my brother when I was 10, because my kids were young. They were young kids. Now I was inside and I've got grandkids now. Do you know what I mean? You know, I've got 13 grandkids and they'd like, my oldest granddaughter, she was coming up to visit me in Acre. You know, I never, I've never met her outside of jail from she was born, you know? So to talk to, where did you get the sentence? Was it Old Bailey or somewhere? Seriously? Old Bailey, Old court. Bailey, and what was it, when she went to trial? And court number one in the Old Bailey. How long was the trial? The trial was um, three months. Three months? Yeah. Jeez, it's hard work, isn't it, going back and forth? It's, it is hard graft, and the, the, the World, World Cup football was on and all that, and there was all the, one day we decided not to go, and we, we took the television out of the, the screws um, 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 common room and put it in the middle of the landing on House Block 1, because we, we was all remanded prisoners at that time, but they housed me on a block as an ACAP with all the lifers. On where house Block this? 1, Belmarsh. Belmarsh, Hellmarsh, yeah. they call it. Yeah, in House Block 1. And they housed us with all the lifers. So we took the telly and said, we ain't going to court today. Everybody's wearing their football vests and, 
England, England, and should be. Brazil was playing. And how long did you be on the mind at that point by the time it came round to the about a, about a year. Yeah. And so it must have been like say been devastating moment, life changing moment, getting a 23 year sentence. Uh, yeah, it was, it was, it was. But I'm, I'm, I made up a motto. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm not going to waste no time. I'm not going to kill no time. That's why I wrote this book, Killing Time. Because I decided I'm not going to kill any time. So I decided, after I learned to read and write, I set myself, I had one of these books, like, you know the solicitor's books, where they give you to take notes, and it was empty. On the way in after I got sentenced, straight in at reception at Belmarsh, you know, if you're a double A cat, you go into a separate little pod and wait for them to see you through and go through the reception stage, strip search and blah, 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 and what have you. So I nicked the screw's pen, just for spite. He said, oh, you're back with us, De Silva. I heard you got, got a big lamp. Yeah, you're going down the block. I said, what am I going down the block for? He said, yeah, you're double A cat. You're going straight into solitary confinement. You've been sentenced now. So I couldn't read them right. Yeah, I've just got 23 years. They put me straight in the block. Solitary confinement. For me, that was part of seeing it as like trying to break me. Yeah, and trying to, trying to um, kill my spirit. So at that time I was super fit, just exercise all the time and keeping fit. So I ended up writing a list of my exercises every day. So I, I decided to create my own regime within the prison. I'm not gonna eat when they say to eat. When they bring the food round at 11 o'clock, I'm not gonna eat. I'm gonna eat later on, you know? So I, I started doing fasting, not because of religious purposes, but just because I'm not gonna be part of that regime. When the bell goes bing a ling a ling for 11 o'clock to go and get dinner, everybody's bell, belly starts growling and uh, nah, I wasn't a part of that. I get up five o'clock every morning. The screws, when he opens my flap at half past five, he's sleeping his eyes, I'm wide awake. Finish my circuit, sitting there, do you know what I mean? I, so I set my own regime. It's even, even like, it's psychological. Like when I went to Franklin and I got to Franklin, and they bring me back out onto the wing in Franklin, I used to do voluntary bang up. Just bang myself up. Not be on association. Have association when I want it. If I don't want, just bang up. It's like every month, I just pack my bags, I'm going down the block. I said, what you done? They said, I will do something if you want me to, but I'm going down the block because the only punishment they had for you was two things. Either take away your telly or put you down the block. So I used to go down the block every month. Yeah? Right, let's go spend three days a week, then I go back to myself, yeah? The, the other thing what I've done was give away my telly. Give them back my telly. I want back my pound for the TV. Everybody thought, what's the matter with this guy? He's really nuts. He's giving up a telly. But for me to do the work, what I needed to do, and learn the Archibald and learn the law, because I went to the House of Lords in 2011 to um, um, introduce a book by Abu Jamal, Prisoners Defending Prisoners. Because I've done a lot of law work for the guys. Done all their ACATs, done all their, um, their, their, their recategorizations, I've done all their appeals, showed them how to do it themselves and learn to do it themselves. I bought an Archibald for £250, had a brand new Archibald, and I learned to use the law the way it's supposed to be used. And I taught guys how to work their cases because I noticed that most guys leave it to their solicitor. They don't understand about this, this thing which I'm teaching now, which is common law. A lot of the guys don't understand about learning about what the law entails for them as a living being. So in the prison system, you teach guys how, first of all, the solicitors don't represent you. They're supposed to present your case. There's no representation. You represent yourself. Because if they lose your case, the first thing they say to you is, I am, you're the instructing client. So I'm following your instructions. So whatever instructions you gave me, that's why we lost the case. Yeah? But you don't know nothing about it because you ain't been looking up the case of law or you ain't been looking up what the law means towards your case. So that became a big thing for me, especially in the um, dispersal units, you know, in the ACAT system.
Yes, this is a great thing, so I heavily commend you for doing what you're doing. So most people who get those big stretches like that end up falling into the path of drugs and self-harm and all this sort of stuff. All sorts they? of shit, yeah. Um, yeah. So I commend you for all the sort of teaching you've done to yourself and then obviously pass on and trying to help all the other sort of people. And so talk to me, you must have obviously been shit around the whole jail system during that book. Did you ever appeal the sentence? I did, yeah. And obviously... Well, I, I, I got, I got, I got um, um, 27 years to start. So I got four years off. I appealed. I done all our own appeal for all of us. Did you get caught? My whole crew. Yeah, the whole. We didn't kill no one. Hundred guns. No, nah, we didn't kill no one. That we didn't. No, no shots fired on any kind of robbery. Like I said, it was a lot to do with the colour of my skin. We weren't supposed to be an organised, capable gang going out there and doing professional robberies. And so your lawyer did a shit job, obviously. Yes. Or was it more of a stitch up in the courts? Didn't I think I think it? the court system just stitched us up. We was going to get a, a, a guilty no matter what. And do you think the lawyers are like part and parcel of it all in that? Or, or, or of course they are because the listen, the, of course they are. Listen, the system is 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 a closed circuit. Yeah. Remember, um, they run maritime law. Maritime law means it's the law of the sea. So the judge is the captain of the ship, and those people is quartermasters. So the Queen's Council, for instance, who represents you when you've got a big case, that's Queen's Council. It's the Queen's Court. Of course. Right. So if he's Queen's Council, who's he working for? Queen, yeah. He don't speak English. He speaks Latin. So only the judge and him know what they're talking about. You're in the dock. It's been there for the last three weeks. It's foreign language the whole time. It's, it's a foreign, foreign language. Yeah, you I don't know. know. You don't know what it's they're saying. Alien. Yes. Eight hours a day and it's fucking hard work. Yeah, yeah. It is. It is. It's definitely hard work. But if you learn it and you get to know it, they can't come with all the nonsense they're coming out with and accuse you of this and accuse you of that. You know what I mean? Like, there was no, like, as far as having contracts and the arrest has to be legitimate, the actual charge has to be legitimate, that, you know, how they charge you, the acts of the charges, the, 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 the section of the charge, it's all detailed down so that they have to follow their own laws. But if you don't know it, how can you pull them up? Yeah, I mean, I, I combed it forensically. You can't rely on these people like so. No, you, you can't. It's your life, isn't it? That's You're right. That's side. right. Because or, or the only thing what the barrister says to you straight away is like, you're the instructing client. I'm following your instructions. But yet they do their own thing. No, I'm not going to do that. You're going to do that. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to do that. But yet you're saying, well, why are you going to do that when I want you to do that? Because I know better than you. And then when they lose and they say, oh, shit, I should have done what you said, but you're the instructing client. So that's it. Yeah, so you end up becoming what they call like a jailhouse solicitor, like helping the prisoners with their cases. And their yeah, work, jailhouse lawyer, like yeah, that, yeah. Helping everyone out. Yes. That must be rewarded and stuff like this, helping a lot of people. That it was them. watching people get off and stuff like that. The, the best was watching people beat cases in, inside. You know when they get to the block, they call me up as a McKenzie friend. If you've got De Silva as your McKenzie friend, you're busting case. That's crazy. So you're, <laughs> you're, you're coming down re representing people down there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's brilliant. Yeah, I ain't saying nothing, get the silver down there, my, my Mackenzie friend, yeah. And so you said you ended up getting 27 and got down to 23, was it, after the appeal? Yeah, four years off. And you end up serving, how, how much of that, 23? 19 years. 19 years, that's crazy, especially with the learning and stuff like this. You did. Why did you serve so long? I got another charge. I got nicked while serving um, for two kilos. On the street, the, yeah, the they, conspiracy for you through phones and what some no, no, no. They caught me with a kilo of coke, a kilo of oh, everything. this is previous to you end up getting in. Jesus, so what did you end up getting for that? Then I got eight years on top, eight years on top. Jesus, yeah, so 19 years away. It's a huge sentence, isn't it? Yeah, got, uh, massive, a couple, of, massive. A couple of kilos, yeah. And so, what point did you end up getting that, that time added on? Like, so how far were you in? I was in Deca. You're a decap by the time that got added on? Yeah. Joking, that's yeah. crazy. Yeah. Has that sent me straight back to the. Straight back to. Yeah. So, geez, so where were you with decap at that point? Um, um, Spring Hill. And so it taken a long time for this case to come around, then? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, thought I ended up in, in, in Scrubs. I was in Scrubs 20, 2015. I got sentenced in 2016, and then I worked my way through Scrubs. I started up the One Programme, Our Needed Education, in Scrubs. 
like because at that time in 2016, the scrubs, like the violence within the scrubs with the youngsters amongst themselves was the most violent prison in the United Kingdom at that time. Yeah, and it weren't like, they, they helped, I started up a program in the, in, the, um, in the gym with the gym screws and they let me bring kids in there, like the most wildest ones in there. We even done a play with um, Simon Callow, you know, like um, he done Christmas Carol in there, but I ended up becoming the um, production manager with Simon Callow because he wanted real people. So I ended up getting the youngsters who was on my course doing the violence reduction to come and do the play and we've done a wicked Christmas play, you know. Um, we used to have guys who used to be in the block and we used to get them to come out the block to come gym, to do the course, you, you understand? So like, um, I have to say fair play to a certain screw in there, um, Alan Gawley, he did a proper, proper geezer. Yeah, he, like, he used to help me and like... They're not all bad, some of them are good Yeah, they're, 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 they're people. They're human beings just like you and I. Yeah. They're doing their job, but like the job they're doing is fucked, but That's it's crazy. a job, it's their job, you know? But Alan Gawley kept it real with me and like, he was the one who allowed me to set up the call. They scrapped it at first because it was working. All the cutting stopped on the wing, the kids stopped scutting each other. And then one day, one screw got stabbed in his head. And then they begged me to oh, start it again, you know what I mean? But like, they scrapped it because it was working. There was, they weren't stabbing and cutting each other. There was no justification for whatever they're doing. And a screw got stabbed in the head in scrubs and they all went outside on strike, left us banged up in there, you know? And that's where, how I got to start the book club as well. Cause I was going, Alan Gawley asked me to get the kids, the real people to come. Cause you know, in most of these book clubs and things what happen in jail, you get the tea boys the nonces and certain undesirables who always end up getting to see these outside people and getting to see these people who run book clubs or these TV people and whatever. But they said, nah, um, can you do it? So I ended up getting real people to come to learn to read and write. And what I've done, I got people who was banged up with someone. I, uh, I ended up asking the screws, look, this geezer can't read and write bang him up with this geezer who can read and write. And then I used to get the books and give it to him. And then they used to, one of them used to read the books to each other. So then they're learning to read, you know? And then it became really good. So it, um, That's incredible, he does some incredible things. Mark. Yeah, give a book, give a book. They came to my last um, book club here. I have the book club here at Tabernacle. They came, but give a book come, comes here and they buy the books for me as well. When, say, like, if you came as an author and you've got a book out there, they'd buy 10 of your books and I'd give it out to people, they'd read it and come and we'd review it. Yeah. Uh, I know, it's incredible. And obviously, to get through a 19 year sentence, you must have had a strong faith as well, as well as the teachings. So, was it faith that got you through that time in there, spirituality? Yeah, mu Muslim. Muslim. And yeah. so that obviously helped you to get through that? Well, it, 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 being a Muslim, it's, it, it, you keep yourself clean, you pray five times a day, yeah, your diet. It, 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 you perfect your diet, you know, and there's a lot of um, positives for being a Muslim within that respect, especially being in jail. But you can't, a lot of people use it as a crutch or, uh, or a device to protect themselves in certain respects. But if you use it for what it really is, it does really help you spiritually. Mm. And so obviously you're on a sort of teaching and helping thing the whole way through your sort of jail sentence. Did you come across any trouble in there? Obviously during that time there's obviously a huge few times, yeah, you, everybody, they, 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 you're never trouble free, especially in jail. It's part and parcel of it. Yeah, yeah, it's no big deal. And so you ended up going to jail, what age were you when you went away? 38. 38 when you went away, so you came out at 57? Yeah, so I'm 59 now, I've been out two years. A huge amount of time away, and yeah. so going on to, obviously you've come out and you've carried on doing the same stuff and ended up transferring these skills you've got and helping the community now in a massive way. So talk about, obviously, lead up to coming out and then when you come out now you're straight back in the community, talk to me a little well, bit. Well, I've always kept up with community, like um, f um, um, especially, um, you know, like um, the gadget books and keeping up with the magazines and reading and finding out about society. So I wasn't lost when I come out. I just didn't like being around a lot of people. You know, like West End and stuff. When my missus took me up West End, I didn't like it. Loads of people, I didn't like it. That oh, part, it. yeah, it, that was kind of hard, but I've got used to that now. But then I decided, like, I was reading, um, what's his name now? 
something cool. Um, um, with it, it, he's got a saying. It says, within every adversity, there's an equal seed of opportunity. So, I've all the way through my whole bird, I've found the positivities to use to, to better myself. So coming out now, I've wanted to pass that on to the youngsters. I've got a few of them, like I met a guy when I was in, I went back to Spring Hill. Again, I got my decat and went to Spring Hill from Scrubs because I've done a lot of good work in Scrubs. So I got my decat, went back to Spring Hill and I went out to work every day. I was working out every day for a year. And I met a guy named Courtney Edwards. He's uh, 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 um, one of the top managers for Wilmot Dixon Building Construction Company. And I met him on, on a site in Oxford. They was building the McDonald Hotel at the hospital in Oxford. And they had a program for all the labourers, not just the ones from jail, because there were only four of us from jail, but there was about 40 labourers there. It was a big site. And they had a, all the labourers to work for a week with a skilled person, either a bricklayer, electrician, fire stopper, whatever it is, groundsman or whatever. And I put my hand up and I said, I want to work with him. And he said, a, 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 a Caribbean guy called me and he, I said, I want to do his job. They said, what do you mean you want to do his job? You don't want to be like, I said, no, I don't want to do none of this labour and stuff. I want, I want to work with him, the one who's walking about with the board and the pen. They said, really? I said, he said, yeah, let him come and work. And ever since I met him, we became best of friends. And he's the guy, when I jump guys out of the gangs in Grove and disarm them, I bring them down there to work with Wilma Dixon. They've actually set up an academy now down there called Building Better. Yeah, where they got kids who come out of gangs, come out of, off the street, and they go straight in there, get their CSCS card, get their program, they can go to college, they pay for them to go to college, to do their electrician, plumbing, and what have you. And they're building social housing down there. Um, so they're working in their own area, building housing in their own area. It's incredible. Matt, it, yeah, it's beautiful. So, have you formed a charity or anything like this? Since I formed the CIC. It's called One. Um, our needed education community interest company. And so obviously like you say you're back in Ladbrook Road, the place that's obviously close to you where you've always grown up, always been based around here. Yeah. And helping the community in a big way at the moment. So you do a lot of charity work with the homeless people as well. Well, I, 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 what I've done, I started doing it. What, what I first started doing, you know Grenfell? Yep. Grenfell, I watched Grenfell burn from Scrubs, yeah? And it was close to my heart. And when I came out, I'd done I was running a restaurant for someone on Port Bella Road. So I'd done a fee, uh, solidarity for Grenfell, fed, fed about 200 people. <coughs> and then um, after that, I decided there's so many homeless people on the streets, and that was during the pandemic. There were so many homeless people on the street. I said, look, come and get some food, come and get some food. So I went round to all the local people and I said, look, can you put something in there? The butchers give me some meat, the cash and carry give me rice, peas and veg off the Port Bella market. And I just cooked it all and give it to them. And I just kept giving it to them. So I just kept that rolling. You know, like you could do a one-off thing and it'd be great for that one-off time. And then years later, people say, well, what did he do after that? I wanted it to be some consistency involved in it. So what I started doing, I started going around and finding the people who was out on the streets and hungry and get, like, I took a lot of the clothes what people had collected for Grenfell because they had it like over four years in their houses. Bags and bags of decent clothing, warm clothing. And this was last winter. And I took it all off them and I went around giving it out to the people who needed it. That's incredible, well done. Yeah. So like I say, you did incredible, incredible thing. I can only commend you, especially after so long away. Like I say, you said it was hard stop, you jumped like back on your feet real quick. It's only a couple of years since you've been out. You I, I, so much positive stuff, so I can only commend you. Well, well I, found, I found, like, I get my commendation from the universe. I, I, I feel, I learned something that the, like, we're not in the universe, you know. The universe is in us. Do you understand? And, and we are totally and spiritually, physically connected to the whole of the universe. So, I find that when I'm doing good things, I feel good about myself. I feel good. At, at, if I want anything, I manifest it and I think, well, I want that and it, I get it, you know, within reason and, I, 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 and I'm not thinking like this, I don't need to be a millionaire, I don't need to have millions and millions of pounds, I don't need to have a Lamborghini parked up outside, I don't need that, 
There's no need for it. My necessities and all my needs are met. But this is incredible. I can only commend you that I said, uh, especially after so much time away, to have such a mindset that you do that, doing so much positive as well as obviously helping yourself, to help all these other people. And the beat it's goes incredible. on. Yeah, and, and so the... talk to me about this book club. Obviously, you know, let's go back onto your book, Killing Time. When did you write that? Was that while you're inside or was that? I wrote that in Scrubs. I wrote, wrote it and published it. I am self publishing. In when I was I'll behind, a little bit there, I was behind the door in Wormwood Scrubs. Yeah, it's it's on Amazon, and a, a percentage of the money goes to Grenfell. Yeah, so guys, there'll be a link below in the description for the book. Go onto that, get it, support. Yeah, it's it's on Amazon. It's only a tenner, but it, it it details the journey from not being able to read and write and not killing time and not wasting no time. And so is there any more books in the pipeline for you? I'm writing one now called Not In Real. Nice. This is about my whole life story and like, it's called Not In Real, The Real Borough of Kensington and Chelsea. And so what would that be like, the full, full That's on, the full, full on, on full on everything, everything. Everything involved. Yeah, everything. The robberies, the prison, the growing up, everything. The whole caboodle. And so when are you hoping for that to come out then? Well, I, I should finish it by next year. I've been doing so many different things. Well, I can't wait to uh, read that. And obviously, when that comes out, we we'll have to come back and. Yeah, that definitely. And definitely. We'll million, know, we'll million percent. So, talk to me this evening is uh, Friday night. And so, talk to me about what's going on later on tonight. Obviously, we're at the Tabernacle, like I said. Talk to me about the Tabernacle. This evening, this, e this evening, we do a class called All Law and Enlightenment, where we teach about civil law, we teach about natural law the law of the universe, we teach about astronomy. Um, Nico, who, 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 who's a good friend of mine, a good close friend of mine, he comes and he teaches people about Kundalini, we teach people about the stars, the sun, the moon, you know, like just last month we had, did you know, notice that there were so many different things going wrong in your life? Uh, my life was going, I was in Crown Court at six That's weeks right, old. so many different things going, like different right. adverse things going on. It's um, because it was Mercury retrograde. So he, he, he teaches a lot about using the star, sun and the moon to work out what's going on in your life. Times to just keep your backside quiet, times to develop yourself and stuff like that. And we do all that here, we teach a lot of law. This is, this is one of the... Um, Main books, Meet Your Straw Man. Lift it up slightly, please, Mario. Yeah. yeah, these books. Yeah, no, so I've heard a lot about this over the last couple of years. People telling me I need to learn about yes. this sort of stuff. So it's it, really it, real interesting to know. And this is, so Law of the Land and the Common Law. This that's is, right. About, um, is it about your rights and stuff? That's like right, this? about no, no, um, no, being a, a living being, you know? Knowing about your amiable rights. Don't, don't you know, it's the real rights what, what serve you. They call them alien. <laughs> They do everything so bold-faced within this society, yeah? That it, it's so blatantly obvious what you should or should not be doing. It's like learning about being honourable. Everything in life is about honour. This is how they do things. So like you get a ticket on your car and you ignore it or you throw it in the bin, you're being dishonourable. If you write a letter back to them saying if there is no um, injured party, there is no, this letter is void, then you're being honourable. They can't take you to court for that. But if you threaten the dustbin, you don't reply to them and you don't answer to them, then they take you to court. Then being in court is dishonourable. It's all about honour. I need to learn about that. I've got about five grand worth of parking tickets. <laughs> what about all these council tax bills, electricity bills and stuff? All like these that? things, all these things. You, you, do you, you have to pay them? Yeah, you do. If, you, if you're using someone's shit, then you have to pay for it, don't you? But um, you don't have to pay for a TV licence. So I don't know for that. I don't watch BBC or no TV programs. That's all you have to say to them. I don't watch I, um, iPlayer or BBC, and you don't have to pay it because listen, they're putting shit out on the airwaves. You're just grabbing it with your. You've got a receiver. Of course. And um, so you know this fortnightly class you run. Um, it's here every every other Friday. Yeah. And so can anyone? Is that just for like London people, local to here? Anyone in the world can come. So anyone who's watching this can come and attend your class. They can come to Tabernacle, Tabernacle. attend the class and learn about knowledge of self, all and all law. When we say law, we're talking about maritime law, civil law, and law of nature, the law of God, yeah? So it, 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 it's, that's why we call it all law and enlightenment. So it's just to wake people up, and that's what we're doing. 
That's incredible. And uh, as well as all this other stuff, you've ended up doing some music stuff since you've been out as well. And talk to me about that. Well, uh, um, it's actually Nico, the guy who runs this class with me, he's got two tunes out there. One's called Higher Ascension, one's called No. The one called No is, a, is my favourite as well. I'm just in them with him and just helping him, um, like giving him the enthusiasm and uh, moral support with it. But they're big tunes. They're, all, they're out on YouTube as well by Nico Day. Yeah, um, I done a tune with him in 2012 called um, No Taxes, um, Goodbye Tariff. It's called Goodbye Tariff and it's on there. I done a tune in there where I, I had a part in there. Um, um, I done a, a, a sort of a words, spoken word kind of thing. I profess to manifest whole words into living flesh. 12 tools of Kemet is what I profess. Knowledge, wisdom and understanding must be gained to attain the next three jewels which is food, clothing and shelter. Once you can feed yourself, clothe yourself and you've got shelter, you can gain justice, freedom and equality. Once all nine jewels are maintained, you will have love, peace and happiness in your life. I profess to manifest whole words into living flesh. So, is that on YouTube as well? Yeah. Alright, so we'll put the links below for the... For yeah, the... yeah, it's Goodbye Tariff. It's cool. So like I said, you're already doing incredible things. But talk to me about your sort of plans and your goals for the coming years then. And well, I want to finish my book, yeah, and I, I want to make a film. I'm, hope, um, I'm, I'm working with Saloon Naji. Do you know Saloon Naji? Mm -hmm. He was um, the director of Lufa. Okay, he's yeah, actually fantastic. he's actually working on Bridgerton right now. Yeah. Yeah. He's 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 gonna draft up a script to do with a story to do with me and my brother in Labrador Grove, like, and coming up. Like yeah, yeah. I've stuff. got to finish the book first, though. Of course. So that he could then the draft the script. Yeah. Like I said, you've got some great things coming up, then, as well as all the help you're doing in the community. And so, for sort of people who are thinking, oh, you're doing great stuff, and they want to help out, how can people help out? How can they reach out to you to get in touch? Well, go on my Instagram, not in real nine two five. If they want to pledge something or help or volunteer, there's plenty of room to volunteer. I've, on the Mondays, we've got the pensioners who do cake and tea. I cook for them every other week with um, pilau and big rice and peas and stuff for the pensioners down there. The winter time, I clothe them with jumpers, hats, woolly hats and stuff like that. If anybody wants to help their community, I'm here, you know? I'm on Instagram. It's um, um, not in real, N-O-T-T-I-N-G-R-E-A-L 925 on Instagram. And the links will be below guys, go in the description box and you'll find the link straight to his Instagram. Yeah. So guys, support as well, he's doing absolutely fantastic things and I look obviously for big things to happen for you in the future. And hopefully this is just a start as well, I hope you can do lots of parts down the line, that's it, when your book comes out, if not before. Definitely, Maybe definitely. I look, I look forward to sitting in this class in a minute. Yeah. And so I yeah, I don't know whether you want. Um, we can maybe film bits of that. I can put the camera in the back. Well, we have to ask Nico first when he comes. Yeah, yeah. we'll find that and then uh, yeah. we'll show the people. If not, people, like I said, you've got an invitation to come to these classes. Yes. Every other Friday, get on to Manuel's Instagram. You'll be able to find out what Friday it is. It's like well, if, from today, it'll be two weeks time. Yeah. And then. From the, that Friday, every two weeks. Yeah, yeah like I said, it's been going out for a few days. And then so, um, yeah. we do we do a book club at the end of every month. So the next book club is at the end of June. I'll let you know. We've got a young lady who's going to be doing her book, and Jacku, who works for Amiga Radio, she's the one who actually runs the book clubs. Um, Jacku, she she has a radio station on every Monday evening from six drive time, yeah. from six p.m. Jacku. Yeah, big things. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. fair play to you. And so, like, guys, remember, don't forget uh, about the book Killing Time. Again, that link's below as well. Go in there and that also supports Emmanuel and the great things he's doing. And look up the tunes by Nico Day on, on YouTube Higher Ascension and No. K N O W, No. That's a big tune. Yeah, so, guys, go and look it all up. And uh, so, I just want to say a big thank you again for giving us the time. I look forward to sitting in this car for a minute and learning some stuff. So, need some of this knowledge myself. Yeah. So congratulations on everything you're doing, the place you went to come out of there so enlightened and yeah. all this knowledge and then spreading it. Well, yeah. I had a lot of support from my wife, Laura, 
and I'd like. So your wife stuck by you forever? Right, yes, she stuck Fair by me. Like a shout out to Laura. Yeah, a shout out to Laura, yeah, definitely. Love you like that. Yeah, yeah. Babe. And um, more power to all the people. Okay, fair play. Guys, reach out to him on Insta and until next time, thank you very much. Alright, one.